Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, uh, back for the second part of the six slot repair here. You saw in the previous video we had problems with uh, it booting, it wasn't booting from the uh, Unibars there, uh, well any ROM in fact, even the diagnostics ROM. Yeah, so in the previous video we solved some problems with uh, corrosion, you know, it broke in various traces. I'm going to patch up some of the traces properly in this video, we'll clean it up as well. But uh, the way we left the last video, it wasn't booting games, you know, you got the crosshatch up there, you could uh, run the diagnostics and all tests would pass. I couldn't test the sound, uh, so there may be a problem with the sound side of things as well, although that might be related to the corrosion we saw on the top board. Yeah, and here's that corrosion on that top board. Um, so I'm going to start by just getting some uh, IPA and uh, a toothbrush, and I'm just going to uh, scrub around that area actually. And we'll have a look just to see what, if any, damage is there. I'm hoping we might just have one or two broken traces, maybe. It doesn't look like it's made its way through to this side of the board. So it may well just be uh, a single, you know, one or two traces and a via. You know, the vias there look okay it's dirty but I'll clean that top side as well with some IPA and cotton buds now I just want to try and get the majority of the stuff in the middle out actually let's just hope that this is the fault because you know the other thing with this is th there could be uh, you know a logic fault i.e. you know a failure an actual chip has failed you never know why was it put into storage I mean I suspect actually this was operational um, up until the point of the battery uh, caused the problems uh, and then you know that leaves me with the you know the, the frustration if you like that somebody you know you can see I don't know that I've not shown it in this video but the blue plastic that was over the top of this suggests that someone had kind of consolized it uh, why on earth did they not take the battery off before they started it's like what I, th I suspect they've been using it because there's you know they've written on the uh, blue cover in there to say what everything is in terms of the inputs and outputs and stuff uh, you know, for the joystick ports and the slots and all that sort of stuff. So I think it's been used. I think someone's been using this, but they never removed the battery. It's like I don't get it. Why would you do that? So now we'll go over with the uh, toothbrush. It's looking awful, actually. It's looking really awful. Uh, in a minute, I'll get some vinegar onto this as well. I think. I think there's more corrosion here than there was on the bottom board, actually which makes me think it's been upside down for a period of time with that battery like that you know leaking away there and it running onto this board I think there's too much corrosion there for just vapours because what you know when I say vapours the, the stuff that leaks out it does kind of uh, evaporate and sort of form like a, uh, a gas if you like that floats around to things nearby but yeah the level there is a bit too high it looks like it has actually uh, leaks off. Yeah, I'm getting uh, paper towel all over this here, so I'm gonna have to brush it again in a minute. It's uh, all right, mess that. Yeah, I think at this point in time now, I'm just gonna let that uh, dry off, and I'm gonna inspect super close to see what damage I can see. Yeah, it's pretty well corroded. This. Can you see? We've got a trace gone here. Some of these are gonna be gone and questionable. Uh, look up here. You've got two or three traces that you can't even see them. The corrosion's that bad, can you see here? There's like two or three traces run along here. They're gone. They're completely disintegrated. One or two here disintegrated. And connections to and from, you know, those there. Uh, I can't even see a trace. Oh yeah, there's one or two here that have gone. They've gone here, look at that. Bubbled up and stuff. And they may well have burnt out with a bit of current going through these once it's uh, powered up in that state. Uh, here. Uh, here. <laughs> look at this. Horrendous. So yeah, luckily it's in a confined area there. But still, there's quite a few uh, things to patch up. So I'm going to go over this next with the um, this tool here, you know, and I scratch all this, the surface corrosion off to get it as clean as possible. And we'll start to get some flux and, on there and drag the solder braid around, tin up any traces and work out where we've got breaks. And so I'll try and show you what I'm doing here, and it's really hard because I'm using macro and I can't actually see what I'm doing. But I'm just going over the trace like that and the green mulchy sort of stuff that's on the top which wasn't being brushed off wasn't coming off at all uh, comes off and the other thing which I'll use in a minute is a fiberglass pen actually um, but can you see here it's like look the brush didn't bring this off it's like uh, it's stuck you know it's the oh I don't know what it is but it sticks on the top look at that it's awful 
Um, once I've gone over like this, I'll then go over with a fiberglass pen. The fiberglass pen, I'll probably bring this off anyway, but then I'll mess my fiberglass pen up. I'd rather just uh, clean off the majority of it this way, actually. So after some light scratching, brushing with the fiberglass, brushing it all off, it's uh, a lot cleaner, but it's still got green bits of stuff around there. The next thing I'm going to do is treat that with some vinegar. I'm just going to put some vinegar on there and just leave it for about 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, and then uh, brush it all off, wipe it down with some more IPA, brush that off. Um, and then I'm going to try and get a bit of flux onto the pins of the uh, chips here and suck up the old crusty solder. That's going to take a bit of work actually. There might be some scratching required on the, sol the surface of the solder first in order that I can actually then uh, get the flux to bite because this is the problem you get like a contaminant on the, the very edge of the surface there. And you try and heat it with solder on it, it won't even melt. Um, and one or two of the pins have gone. You know, the, the stub's still there, so it's still, you know, soldered through to the other side. The other side of the board's fine. I don't think I need to replace these components at this stage, or, or even take them off. I think I can just literally just get rid of the old solder, put new solder on, and then patch up the damage. So I did soak it for about 20 minutes in vinegar and then cleaned it off again and it's looking a lot better actually. You can see it looks a bit patchy here because there's still a lot of muck on the board um, but all of the greenness and all the pins has uh, it's come off. So I'm going to desolder, use the desoldering station next and desolder all the solder from here and reintroduce new solder on those chips. Um, there's like nine or so chips here and just this one down here I think maybe this one here as well so like 10, 11. So in terms of damage we've got uh, a trace there there's a break it doesn't look like there is but there is and then we've got three traces down here none of those are working three there none of those are working and i think a link up here or something that's not right either uh, and then I need, once i've done all that i need to check the vias from you know any of these vias that are affected here to make sure they're going through to the other side so there we go that's the uh, rat's nest of wires i've ended up with uh, obviously i need to clean this and tidy up some of the solder points there but yeah there's a lot of damage as you can see uh, and I don't know 12 13 14 traces there maybe it's uh, scary it was pretty much every single trace down here and uh, most of the traces uh, up here as well uh, and one up the top there well much to my surprise this is actually working it worked first time after I did that uh, all those wires there I'm shocked uh, so if I stick a credit in, you'll see we're on uh, Fatal Fury 3, hit select, Magician Lord, select, King of Monsters 2, select, Real Bout, Fatal Fury Special, select, Crosswords 2, select, Metal Slug 5, and everything works, they work fine. Let's just reboot it, I'll select a different game. Initially there was uh, an issue with slot 1, I put the game in, it, wasn't, it was detecting it, but then it crashed. And I put it in the second slot, wouldn't detect it at all. But after I cycled the carts around a few times in the different slots, it started working. So I think it was just it's dirty contacts. That's all that was uh, the final issue there. Uh, so I stick a credit in again. Let's start a different game. Let's choose uh, that one. But it's fine. Perfect sound, perfect graphics, no issues. The only thing I'm not sure about is on the super gun here, uh, I've only got sound come from one side. But I vaguely remember that I've had this with a few different MVS boards. Maybe my four slots the same, I can't remember. I'd need to connect some headphones up to uh, determine whether it's working correctly. But uh, yeah, it would appear it's fine. So I do think whoever owned this um, was using it in a consoleized form, you know, that's why they got that blue plastic on there. And they just didn't check, change the battery. If they'd removed the battery, there wouldn't have been an issue. And I wouldn't have had to do all these blooming wires and stuff. Sweet. So what do I need to do next? Well, uh, a lot of clean up work and to tidy up uh, all the wires and things on this, on both sides, finish cleaning up some of the corrosion on the bottom board. Um, so as I work my way around that, I'll perhaps show you a few things. So yeah, just uh, gently going uh, around this whole area uh, with uh, IPA here. This has been cleaned a number of times, like 20 times, you know, as I've gone round. Because as you solder some of these points, and I've soldered to vias, it's had to use vias, you know. And when you when you do that, what I've done is, you know, use a, a very sharp tool, like a pin, 
or something like that. I use this, it's got a very uh, sharp edge there uh, on the tip. Uh, and scratch the very top very gently of the vire in a circular motion around the surface of the vire so you can see copper. Uh, more often than not, part of it will disintegrate away on one side where the corrosion's eaten into it. Um, but then what you want to do is uh, add some flux, you know, chip quick or something else, some of the flux that's good, and uh, push, uh, you know, melt the covering off the wire. Off, you know, use something like Kynar. That's what I've been using Kynar here, the very thin stuff. Uh, melt the covering off so you've got, I don't know, a millimetre or two, and push it into the wire, and then heat uh, with some solder at the same time, you know, and you'll see the solder blob around the wire there and you've you know leaked into the wire as well and then and test connectivity to the other side to make sure that that wire is then joined to the wire on the other side of the board um, you know it's really super time consuming this bit alone I would say it's taken me about three hours maybe three and a half hours it's incredibly time consuming the other thing is with the solder I'll show you up close in a minute the first two chips up there which were really badly corroded I went as far as removing all the solder off them um, and re-soldering uh, them, you know. Um, but the ones down here, I've just, uh, I, you know, you can see they're a bit bodgy. I'll show you up close in a minute. I just got a bit impatient. I couldn't, honestly couldn't be bothered removing every single bit of crusty solder. The main thing is the corrosion is dealt with. But what happens is, is that an after effect of the corrosion, you get like a coating on top of the solder. It leaves like a brownie sort of dark grey sort of crustiness that when you try and heat it with the iron, even with flux, nothing happens. It's like solid concrete or something. It won't, the solder will not flow at all. It's like the heat is just not passing through. There's like a barrier in between the iron and what, you know, the solder point. And you've got to, again, use a sharp tool like that to scratch the solder all around at different angles, up and down the pin, all around. You can see the stuff being scratched off. And then you you know rinse repeat, put some more flux on there, heat it with the iron. You start to see some of it start to flow. You use the desolder braid or the desolder pump, or in my case, I've been using the desolder station to remove that crusty solder. Most of the solder comes off, but not all of it. Scratch away again. Clean up with cotton buds. Add some more solder and flux. Then it starts to flow, uh, you know, a lot better. It's ninety percent the way there. Remove the solder. Rinse repeat. You can spend. You know, like literally 20 minutes on one strip of, you know, seven or eight pins, you know, just going over and backwards, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, cleaning it with IPA, you know, and eventually you've got back to nice silver looking pads, you know, once you've removed the solder and you can then add fresh solder and it solders like, as you'll see those top ones, solders like a new chip, like there's nothing ever happened there. But it's so time consuming. Anyway, we're as clean as we're going to get around here, I think. So I'll use some cotton buds and stuff uh, next just to mop some of this up. And then I might just brush the board off at an angle. Um, the other thing, you know, I'm looked, looked out here because if you look where this connector is here, had uh, the corrosion got under there, that would have been painful. I would have had to remove that connector, but it hasn't. Uh, uh, do the vinegar thing as well, that's the other thing I forgot to mention here, before you start to try and do all the clean up, you know, maybe clean it with IPA to start with, but then, uh, as I did, get some vinegar, you know, white vinegar is what you want, but, I mean, I'll be honest, uh, I've not got any at the moment, so I use malt vinegar, which, uh, yeah, you might think I'm crazy, but it doesn't matter, you're going to be washing it all off with IPA and stuff anyway, it's just acetic acid, you know, and the acid neutralises the alkaline from the battery leakage there. But yeah, the vinegar just helps neutralise the alkaline there. And if you uh, clean off with IPA, it doesn't really matter what kind of vinegar you use, to be honest. So it might not look it, but this top board has had a very thorough clean. Can you see? You get these like weird marks and things on it, and it's just not coming off. It's not dirt. Uh, I haven't gone down the sides of all of these, but I've cleaned the tops of the chips here and around the key areas, gone over the top of the connectors here. Uh, I've done the underneath uh, as well. As you saw, I showed you that bit. Um, but yeah, this, so there's still bits of dirt and stuff all around here, but all of the chips, but all of the chips you can see, you know, because I've gone over the tops of those and I've gone uh, down here like this and across there. Um, but it's super time consuming. I spent the best part of two hours cleaning that up. I mean, you can see in the right light, it looks actually a lot cleaner. Uh, but it just, you do get this kind of like, it's like a residue or something. It's like marks on the board, but it won't come off. It won't come off at all. Um, I can only imagine it's because it's been stored in a damp location for a period of time. I think something started to actually eat away at the uh, the solder mask or something. Um, 
Anyway, the next thing I'm going to do is clean the slots up because whilst they all work, they're just a little bit, uh, what's the word? Sometimes you put a car in, you'll get graphical issues, you take it out, put it back in, then it's all right. Uh, now the pins are all totally, totally straight in every single slot. I just think there's a bit of dirt in there. I have vacuumed uh, the tops of these just to get any particles and things out of there as well. So I'm going to finish off by cleaning up the uh, top side now. Um, I'll scratch around here a bit more to get rid of some of this dark green stuff that's, you know, it's like the, the paint, you know, that's just been affected by the corrosion there. Um, I might just flood fill that with all with solder around there. These three fudgy wires that you can't quite see because they are so small. You can see it was just three, three really fine wires on this side. I've got to relocate those on the other side. I'll do them via to fire, I think. Uh, they'll look a lot tidier on the underside but the other thing I need to do is as you can see I, I socketed up a couple of chips here you know all around this area so I've cleaned up the corrosion there and you can see you know I've done the same thing I always do you know to tin traces with solder there check the wires at the, you know each, at the point I get to each chip you know I've cleaned the legs up here with a wire brush and then used the fiberglass pen uh, the super clean it's got all its original chips now so at one point I did have a couple of replacements in here just to determine whether that was causing me uh, my fault but no it's not I've gone back to all of the originals that came on this board so there were no faulty chips uh, on the uh, top side at all so before I do anything else, so what I'm going to do is remove these, because I've not done, not removed these components here. Uh, remove all these diodes and resistors and transistors caps uh, to clean up around there and to clean up the legs of the components. So you can see I've just removed that cap there. It looks like there's no pads, but it's a case of the corrosion is so bad on this side that it's making them look the same colour as the board, like a green. Uh, you can see if you just scratch off that stuff that's on the, the top there, they start to look, you can see that's almost grey. You can use the fiberglass pen as well. And then we'll clean up with some uh, IPA. Yeah, you can start to see just a bit of a dark grey pad there. Uh, but trust me, uh, that will go back to copper with a bit of work. Yeah, there you go. So you can see, you know, it's a bit worn down on this side here. But we've managed to get that uh, pretty clean. Yeah, these look awful. Uh, I'll do those uh, after I've cleaned up this area. So, yeah, I need to obviously do the same thing with the resistors here as well and that transistor. Um, you can see, you know, they're pretty green there. Yeah, legs are, you know, pretty corroded. But we can clean those up. There you go. So that's the sort of level of uh, tidiness I'm going for here. You know, I've cleaned up the corroded uh, via there. Uh, it doesn't look great, but, yeah, you know, because we've got a bit of it gone there because the corrosion it's the same down here can you see uh, sorry about that yeah this pad here is not great but the connections on the other side th these serve no purpose on this side other than just to hold the pin so sorry camera's wobbling I'm having to hold this on macro but yeah I've circled around the tops there those were really dark grey you couldn't even see uh, they were brown as well you couldn't even see the uh, contacts there and I forget the fiberglass uh, pen onto that as well should see it uh, should come up pretty clean around there actually. And wipe it with IPA as well before we start to reintroduce the component. But can you see that? That's uh, a lot cleaner. And there was uh, loads of corrosion. Uh, before I solder it, I think I need to inspect. I can't see, is there a trace here or something? I need to just uh, tin whatever that is there. I can't see from this distance. So the green uh, transistor legs uh, and any of the other components. All I have been doing with these is using a, a you know, very small tool, a pin or something, just to scratch off the uh, surface corrosion there. Most of it comes off that way actually, just using a sharp tool. Uh, you need magnification really, just so you can see super well what you're actually doing and the, you know, the corrosion hasn't eaten its way into the component. But uh, you can test these, you know, test resistors and caps and diodes and transistors. As you, uh, after you, you know, clean them up and stuff, just to make sure they are working. Uh, wire brush. And finally, the fiberglass pen. You'd be amazed. Uh, these can look good as new if you spend just a minute on each one. Obviously, it's easier just to swap the component out, but sometimes it's not that easy to get certain parts. You know, some of these transistors, you might be able to get equivalents for them. You may even be able to get direct replacements, I don't know, but 
so I'm just trying to relocate this three wires but before I do that I need to clean off all this uh, muck on the ear where this black piece of foam has been it's uh, it's left the right mess it really has I mean there's obviously flux and stuff around here from where I've been resoldering things and there's a few bits of copper where I've been testing traces and stuff so I've got loads of clean up under here to do uh, but I'm going to relocate those three wires on this side of the board actually uh, I traced one uh, you can just see it there, I, I trace one there, um, one of the little wires comes up and then goes across to here. So I can run a wire uh, right down here, down to one of the original three wires, wherever they are, somewhere around here. So I fed the kynar through the wire here, uh, you know, the, I can feel the metal bit stuck out there. And I just need to just bend it over, which I, I'll do that now actually, bend it over, flatten it, put it over the trace, uh, and then solder it. So I left one of the three going through that wire there. It was useful to show you the process, but actually it'd be easier just to pull the wire straight down to one of the other chips. Um, I might do that. I don't know. It looks okay. It looks nice and tidy. Well, it does on the other side. We need to clean up here now. Can you see all these marks as well? It's like someone's leaked something. I don't know what. I don't know whether it's uh, from the elements. You know, it's been in a loft or a barn or so I don't know where this has been stored but it's got some strange marks and stuff on it um, on this side here so yeah I'm gonna need to you know toothbrush this whole area now with IPA and stuff um, try and get it cleaned up so one other thing here uh, just looking at the lid I don't know if you can see this it's uh, had a knock um, yeah that's a better angle can you see that here it's had a, a knock here so uh, uh, the easy way to uh, fix that I think is literally to put some pressure here and lift this corner up so uh, yeah it's going to take a little bit of force that it's had a bit of a knock here as, actually as well can you see uh, if I just uh, move the camera around a little bit can you see this is a kind of weird we just put it up this way here can you see that yeah that's had a knock that needs straightening out I can use some mole grips there actually to straighten that bit but um, yeah the first thing I want to do is try and uh, smooth out this corner yeah, it's had a hell of a dink actually. I can't straighten it out. I'm going to need to uh, use some force, I think. But uh, should I leave this plastic thing on? Yeah, I might just do for the moment. I might just remove the uh, serial numbers and things from it. It's, uh, I guess, it's just some protective covering. It's not very well cut and stuck on stuff, but you know what? It's better than nothing. Well, this needed to come to bits uh, for one reason or another. The button was intermittent. So, uh, yeah, I need to do something with that. Uh, I tried getting some contact cleaner in there, but from this side here, you can see it's just a piece of plastic, which is bound to be... Oh, sh**. Pushed it down that hole there. Something else is, something else for me to deal with. There we go. It's just come out. It's okay. Um, yeah, so I was trying to pull all this apart, and uh, the cable was trapped at that point, and I pulled it, and something broke off. And when I connected it back up, it wasn't working. I thought, oh, no, I've broken the element or something here. So I managed to... Uh, deal with the strain relief this is strain relief down here and you've got to clip it off i don't know where it's gone now uh here yeah the bottom part there clips off and there's a black plastic strain relief inside uh here can you see that yeah that has to get pushed through the blue housing and then the whole lot comes out and you can see what's happened here can you see that contact there it's just come off there so yeah that's super easy to repair it's just a wire I can just literally just desolder it well that's a funny angle and obviously I can't desolder it using the desoldering station uh, I have to use my uh, solder pump and uh, solder iron there uh, to remove that wire and we'll just join a new wire up uh, and I'll inspect while I'm here to make sure it's nice and clean um, I'm not sure what purpose that board serves actually it's just wiring isn't it yeah, there's nothing actually on it. I don't think there's any components or anything. It's uh, just how was the wires. Yeah, and then you can see the element uh, contacts there. I think is that the temperature thing? I think it might be actually. That might be the uh, thermocouple or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, I need to be careful with this before. I'm, yeah, if I'm not careful, I might end up pulling the wires off the button. So just very carefully put that there, and I'm going to try and just replace that wire and then reassemble it. Well, it's game over for the desoldering station. Uh, I've ordered uh, a cheap one. The switch inside, the wire came off and I couldn't get it out. And you can see I've literally had some use mole grips and pull and pull and pull at this to, to get the switch part out. It was just well and truly stuck in there. 
and uh, all the wire uh, which goes around that it would have had uh, wire around it and the wire is like encapsulated in like a ceramic stuff almost like a light concrete you can see some of it uh, there actually it's like a, it's come out it's like a powder it's disintegrated which meant that all the, there was shorting in various places as well as well as the wire detaching on one end it was shorted but this was like uh, I'll show you it was like a coil like that wrapped around the whole thing like really tightly packed um, so this part is still in one piece it's a little bit bent that actually could just do bending that way a little bit but uh, yeah so if I could find a replacement uh, switch parts I and mean, this piece is okay that encapsulate you know the holes the the switch and the rest of it's okay um, yeah it was on its last legs anyway this has already been re-threaded by a friend of mine Albert actually many years ago a bit broke in there and uh, he used to tap and die and got it out that way um, but it was never the same afterwards you know some of the old bits they wouldn't screw in all the way um, you can see some solder in there still needs removing but yeah so I might have to just sell it for spares I'm not sure so apologies it started uh, chucking it down with rain here um, but I thought I'd just clean the board up look how dirty it is yeah so I'm just going to use uh, some paper towel with uh, IPA to go over the larger areas and then I'll focus with some cotton buds and the smaller nooks and crannies and things uh, I just wanted to get the top board not perfectly clean but just a lot more presentable than it is now so a quick example here's a before if you just look at this area here look how dirty the board is there and after a quick wipe there, just look how much cleaner that strip is that I've just wiped. So yeah, not super interesting, but I thought I'd just show you the technique. If you use the wet end of a cotton bud, first of all, um, and then the dry end, and then just go over it with a dry cotton bud, you can get off the little marks and streaks and things that still remain after you've used you know, that first cotton bud with a wet side and then a dry side. And you can see, you know, I'm collecting all the black marks off there uh, pretty well, actually. It's just really time consuming. But the reason I always do this is because you don't know whether you've got any bad traces and things, you know. Um, there are a few places I'll show you once I finish cleaning it where I need to reflow around a couple of ram chips, for example. And I couldn't see that with the level of dirt that was on there. So, yeah, you're probably going to think I'm crazy. I spent two and a half hours uh, cleaning this. But as you can see, it's looking pretty good actually. There's just a few offshoots, you know, and things in between resist, you know, bits of dirt in between resistors. This area down here is not as clean as it could be. I'm going to unscrew these in a minute and clean up uh, the screw heads actually because they're corroded. Um, but before I do that, because I've done so much extensive cleaning, I want to just test it, make sure it's still working. The other thing I'll do is I'll ground the uh, that strap there. I mean, it is grounded, but I'll solder it onto the crystal. These wires here, whilst this is not, I don't think it's an official mod, you know, the micro switch on the corner of the board there, um, I'll just put some heat shrink over these and just label them up. Uh, I think one of them's um, positive, uh, you know, the VCC, and um, the other one is the wire from the battery, so it kind of goes back around to itself, I think. I think that's what's happening. So when the micro switch is, it could be ground even, it might be even ground in the positive side of the battery when you take the board out. That would be dangerous when you power it up. Uh, I would think but uh, anyway in any case I'm gonna leave this on here it's a piece of history uh, and they did do quite a nice fitting of this you know they put the cable ties through the underneath of the caps you know and it kind of just sits nice and tidy on the board there so yeah I'm gonna leave that on there just as a piece of history so I grounded the crystal cleaned up the corrosion massively around here it's just literally bare copper with some little marks and things on it um, Heat shrinked off the end of these here, so those are fine now. I'm going to get some green nail polish. It's the same nail polish used on at Mega Drive. It's kind of like a, a bit shiny, but it'll be fine just to cover that area here. And at the same time, I'm going to cover these here. Can you see? It's just where these coupling caps are. The traces, uh, you know, just needed scratching a bit because there was corrosion there. So uh, I'll, you know, cover those with a tiny little bit of this just to stop uh, further corrosion. And these three wires here on each side. And I've also spotted another bit. Can you see that? I'll show you here. Uh, and this is the technique. You know, you just want to use a sharp tool like this. Can you see? The mask comes off there, the green coating. And you've just got the exposed metal then maybe clean up with uh, well, this is what I've been doing anyway clean up with a fiberglass pen just to get it uh, super clean 
And uh, as I said, there's a few different ways of dealing with that. You could also just drag uh, disolder braid, you know, put some flux on, drag some disolder braid with solder on it and tin it. Like I did with some of the, you know, pads and things around there. But I don't want to spend ages and ages going over, you know, over all of this. So it's easy just to remove the corrosion uh, and then literally just uh, paint over it. Uh, you can get proper green solder mask paint, and I do have some, but you've got to treat it with UV, you know, ultraviolet light. Uh, I've got no easy way. Oh, I've got green on there now. Do you see that? Just on the edge of that connector, it'll come off. Um, but if I just get, you know, a little bit of this there, that's it. That's all it needs, and that'll set and go hard. You could always remove it with acetone afterwards, so it's not permanent, but it's just going to stop corrosion affecting. You know these bits. That's that's all it needs. A little bit, not a lot. Go up there because I think I uh, yeah extended a little bit there. But uh, yeah, that's it. It's almost clear. This it doesn't. You know, it's not like a solid green, but it will do the job nicely. It's almost the same green if you look actually. It's uh, just a bit shiny. I think the shiny elements of it are settled actually at the bottom of this, so it's just it's just a, like almost mostly clear but this you know you can see bits of green in there. I've shook this but it's not made much difference. It's a shame it's not kind of like going in a linear sort of you know an evenness in terms of the green because it's actually almost the right green for this board, surprisingly. You know, often they have like a darker green, but yeah, this one's quite a, a light green. Oh, there we go, got some more of it there. Can you see that? That's almost the right colour. You can still see the copper below, but I could always just touch that up later. So whilst that's drying, I'll point something else out. Uh, Furtec has worked out what these are for. Um, at the point where I was having a problem with the, trying to understand the output and able, he actually uh, went away and started looking at his four slot board saw these slots here, you know, sockets here, and worked out, I think it's for graphics uh, ROM for, uh, you know, the system, uh, I think for the menu or something, and they just never implemented it, they ended up using the fixed ROM and using the stuff on the cart instead. Um, anyway, this, yeah, more information about that down below, I'll post a link to his tweet, I think it was. So the other obvious thing to point out is you'd probably want to recap the board like this. For the moment it's okay, uh, but at some point in the future I'll probably recap it. You can see uh, part of the connector has been chipped off here previously uh, from whoever owned it in the past. And we're also missing one of the wings off here. In theory, if I could find one of these connectors I could either swap it out or I could just literally probably prise out the wing. So as you can see, the bottom board has come out pristine actually, there's uh, barely a mark on it, it's nice and shiny and glossy, um, most of the dirt has been removed, it's looking pretty sweet. I'm going to get a replacement label onto that unibars in a minute, uh, this is the one just borrowing on this board for the moment, I use it for testing all my boards. But uh, yeah, some isoprop got on there on a previous video, um, yeah you can see down here, I'll just zoom you in, yeah not sure if you can see the contrast, the pins here look quite dark. This is one of the things you'll only see when you clean off the dirt. So a little bit of corrosion's got on there. So I think what I'll do with that is, I mean, I've, I've looked at it through the magnifier and actually it's, it's just like really dark gray. It's like there's not any actual acid got on there, well, alkaline got on there. Um, and that's a correction actually. If I've mentioned, if I've said acid damage anywhere in this video, it's actually alkaline. It's alkaline that leaks from these batteries. Um, anyway, I think what I'm going to do is just get the fiberglass pan on the, the end of those three pins there. It doesn't actually need reflowing. On the four slot video you saw me do, it was the same thing. There was more corrosion. It was actual corrosion rather than just a little bit of uh, what looks like oxidisation. So I think fiberglass pens should get those pins there looking a lot cleaner. And I think the one there as well, that top right pin, the other chips all look fine. Yeah, I can see that coming off straight away. It is literally just a bit of oxidisation. And on that side as well. So just a quick look at where I've put the nail polish here. Um, it's not a bad match in colour actually, it's almost the same green, it's just a bit uh, uneven here, you know, where it's been applied. But as you can see, you know, you can't see the copper, that's the main thing. What I can do, as I described uh, a bit earlier, I might just do it now actually, is uh, just uh, pierce a hole there where the uh, battery contact goes, that's all we need. The contact's um, 
there I need to solder it from the other side but the contact is still there uh, I think it's it's just got a bit of solder on it actually it probably needs unblocking from the other side but that is all that is required actually you could easily just drill that to put uh, the battery back in place there um, the main thing is it's not going to start corroding you know the, the corrosion will stop one thing I have found from previous videos I've done where I've done like Amiga 500 pluses and uh, that Neo Geo pocket if you don't completely deal with this like get rid of all of the green stuff and the black stuff just go back, back, back to bare copper get rid of all the crystallized stuff off any solder points off any legs and things like that so they're all back to shiny metal again and if you don't then, don't then coat it with flux and solder or uh, a mask like this you know uh, a covering it uh, starts to corrode again you know bare copper when it's exposed starts to you know go dark it goes black and then any bits of the alkaline that's still there it'll start to go green and before you know it you've got corrosion starting again the Neo Geo pocket I'll perhaps do an update video on that at some point but just recently I took that bit back to part again because it wasn't working again and I realized the corrosion started again even though I treated it with vinegar it had been clean 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 cleaned there was just the smallest little bit that I'd missed and it started off corroding again so you've got to be uh, yeah you've got to be really thorough and that's one of the reasons why um, people in the industry when they come across boards that have got extensive corrosion more often than not will say it's uh, not financially viable you know it's only economical to repair um, I've seen quite a few forum threads and things talking about these four slots and six slots and the boards just sometimes get, you know, many occasions get scrapped because the corrosion around here is so time consuming. I would hazard a guess I've spent something like 12, maybe 15 hours trying to fix this and then maybe four or five hours cleaning it up, both boards. It's been an incredible amount of work over the last month I've spent on this board. But the main thing is it's all nice and clean now and operational. So we'll give this a test. I think what I'll do is I'll load all six slots up. And in theory, I think if we just leave it, it should go into attract mode. Um, and it should use the, you know, play the eye catch of the demo, if you like, for each of those games. It should go through the slot one at a time. Uh, you know, I have done some testing off camera, but uh, yeah, it'd be useful just to show you it is actually working. So the other thing I'll point out, uh, you know, and I haven't mentioned it at all within these two videos here, what is a Neo Geo? Well, it's a, 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 primarily it was an arcade system, you know, so this would sit in an arcade cabinet at this board. Um, what you can do for home usage, you can get what's called a super gun, so you can see this little yellow PCB at the back here, and it's got two controller sockets there for Neo Geo style controllers, a 15 pin. Uh, D-type connector there and you've got a SCART socket and uh, a power connector and the power connector you can see here has got a standard cheap ATX power supply that was one I uh, got working in a previous video actually I replaced the fan and recapped it so that's all you need to get up and running with these uh, boards and the uh, super gun here that connector that plugs into the board there that's um, known as a jammer jammer connector uh, Japanese arcade machine I can't remember the second M is uh, association, yeah, it's a standard. It was a standard they introduced to um, you know unify, if you like, uh, the design of arcade boards, so that you could just chop and change. You know, you could easily swap out the arcade PCB. So as you can see, you got six games in there. It was a bit fiddly. Uh, I had to you know clean each one of them up. It's uh, a lot. Of these have not been used in a long while. So yeah, it was a case of cleaning them up, putting them in, testing it. One or two still had graphic issues, Cyberlip was a pain in the butt, Windjammers was a pain as well, just clean them again, stuck them back in, it's fine, I'll show you. So I switched it on, I'll let it go through uh, the demo there, of each game, just so you can see. Uh, I'll speed some of this up because you're not going to be waiting for all of it, it'll probably take about 10 minutes to go around I reckon.
changes the game, doesn't it? Let's, uh... It's interesting how, when you go around, you then get the Neo Geo logo again. Yeah, let's stick it credit. Let's turn it down a little bit. Yeah, I'm using the volume slider on the board, actually. That, that's how it works, that volume slider is uh, dictating the volume. Sweet, but yeah, you can see it's working fine. It doesn't sound so great with that speaker, and it perhaps needs a recap, but actually the sound is pretty good. It's just the speaker that's sort of I'm testing it with. You know, it's not coming through the TVs or the. Uh, I don't know what any of the moves are in this game. Sweet. So the final thing we need to do is uh, get these uh, screws. There's a nut as well for each one. I'll drop the blooming thing. And all the screws that hold the uh, top board on as well, because it's not just these ones here that support, you know, provide a support to the uh, sockets there. Uh, and like when I had that four slot, I've got one of these missing. I've got three of these long uh, bolts here with a nut instead of four, because there are actually four of these connectors. You can see the fixed wires underneath here. There's only about five or six. That's all that was needed actually in terms of wires. And you can see with the feet, I've angled them all inwards actually. If I just uh, scan you around here. Um, yeah, just to give support, you know, when it's sat on the floor like that, they're all sort of uh, angled inwards. Well, I stuck that screw in there a few minutes ago, and then I just realised the top goes over this, and then the screw goes through the top, you know, it holds the metal top on here, so the corner screws and stuff, you don't stick on till last, actually. Yeah, as you can see here, this is the metal uh, bracket here that I bent back into shape using mole grips, because it was totally malformed. As it is now, it's in the perfect position there and it fits flush, no problems at all. So there was a couple of screws missing actually, well one screw missing, um, one, can you see that? It's torn up that one, it's like a little circle there rather than a cross, so yeah I found uh, through my, some of my spares, I've got loads of these drawers full of spare screws there, I found some of them exactly the same, so yeah I just, uh, so I found one for there and uh, swapped out the one here that had a chewed up head. So because the SD card kept cutting me off in the previous video, there was a lot of things that just didn't get recorded. Um, because what would happen is, my, as I mentioned in the previous video, it would come up saying, uh, please use a fast SD card on the camera screen. But it wouldn't beep or anything. So I'd be talking away and filming, you know, doing things, showing you things for minutes and minutes and minutes, some t in one instance for about 10 minutes. And then look back at the screen and found that message. Found it had stopped recording after about 60 seconds. So uh, yeah, I'll cover some of the basics that I checked right from the very start here. So the first thing we should do is measure the voltage, just to make sure that the power supply is up to the job. Um, because these boards consume an awful lot of current, I think that the 4 slot is rated something like 4, four or 5 amps or something, I would assume this is going to be a little bit more, not much more, maybe five and a half amps, something like that, I don't know. I'd like to, it might not be quite that high, because I know that the ratings they give in the manuals and things are always quite well out, actually. It's like the, the Neo Geo MV1FZ. That uh, says it needs seven amps. It doesn't, it's a typo, I think, in the, uh, the operating instructions, because I measured that 1.3 with a cart, and that's with a multi-cart. But I would assume that a board like this would draw about three to four amps, perhaps. Um, so yeah, find a ground point, the easiest way is any of the TTL chips, seven, the 7.4 series chips, bear in mind this is upside down, so the notch is up this corner here, there, that's pin 1. So the on the same side, furthest away, that's ground, and diagonally opposite here, the, the last pin number on the chip, you can see 5.12 volts, so we've got a nice good 5 volt supply there. You could you know, take it a step further and scope it with a, a scope just to make sure that you've got no ripple and stuff there that's causing problems, but that's what we're interested in, that we're getting 5 volts. If you saw less than about 4.85 volts there, I'd be a bit concerned actually, I would think your power supply is not up to the job. If you saw it considerably less, like I don't know, 4 volts, 3 volts, you're going to have a short somewhere. At that point I would start going around trying to feel the tops of the chips um, because something's going to be shorted it shouldn't, shouldn't drop from 5 volts down to 3 
Um, the other possibility, if you saw something like that, is your power supply is not up to the job. That might be where your voltage just dropped. It could also uh, be that your power supply, you know, if you get no voltage at all, your power supply might have gone into shutdown because it can't provide the current that the board is trying to draw. So the next thing to check was the connections between the 68,000 CPU and the ROM, because if this, you know, if the, C the CPU here has not got a correct data bus and address bus connections, you know, to the ROM, it's got no way of booting. You know, this is one of the things you need to rule out when you've got a watchdog. So if I uh, zoom into that, uh, da, 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 where we're looking at, it's pin 15. So you can see pin 15 here, see CLK, that's the clock. So we'll check that with the logic probe next. But the other thing, there are other pins here that are useful to look at. One of them is, uh, can you see that halt, halt pin? The 68000, when it's reading the data bus, you know, and using the address bus to specify where in the ROM to read from. Let's say, for instance, we had the data bus fault, you know, i.e. something else is con contention on the data bus, something else right into the data bus at the same time as this is trying to read from the, the, the ROM uh, using that data bus. It may read the wrong instruction, which may cause a crash, you know, something goes wrong. And at that point, the halt pin will go low. You see the line above it? Any of these pins here that got a line above it, that indicates active low. So if you were to measure low on pin 17, the halt pin, you would know that the CPU has said, ah, something's gone wrong, I'm halting. I don't know what the hell's going on here, you know, I'm running some code, it's not right, it's an invalid op code, or whatever. Um, there may be other things, the bus error, B error, again, active low, that might go low, to indicate there's a, been a bus error. And I would assume, actually, when the halt pin goes low, the B, E, E, our, our pin probably goes low as uh, in most instances as well I would think um, there are other pins you could check like the read write pin you should check that's pulsing as well UDS and LDS again I would expect those to pulse maybe uh, upper data strobe lower data strobe you know determining whether it's reading or dealing with the lower half of the data bus or the upper half of the data bus um, so you know we measured the voltage okay already uh, there you know those are the things you need to check but in principle the main thing is these A connections you can see here start A1234 and then it goes across to the other side of the chip A5678 all the way up to A19 A20 then you've got uh, uh, the voltage VCC pin but then you've got A21 22 23 you need to check all those uh, address bus connections go to the ROM now bear in mind the ROM has not got that many actually I think the ROM probably stops at like A15 or something like that or A17 I can't quite remember um, but you should have you know if you look at the pinout for the ROM now the ROM is a 27C1024 so if you were to look at the pinout for that, you'll see these A connections around there. And it's just a case of making sure that A1 goes to A1, A2 to A2, A3 to A3, etc. And make sure you've not got any missing. So that's your address bus dealt with. The data bus is at the top. You can see it uh, starts on the other side here. So you've got D0 to D4, 16 of these, and D5 all the way down to D15. Same thing, on the pin out of here, you'll see data inputs, either D0 to D15, I think the Q, the marked Q on the pin out for this chip, Q0 to Q15. And you just need to make sure the same thing, you know, D0 to D0, D1 to D2, uh, D1 to D1, D2 to D2, etc. And that was one of the things I did, just, you know, continuity on the multimeter, beep, 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 you know, I made sure every single connection was there. That is an absolute given if you're getting a watchdog, even with a diagnostics BIOS, you need to make sure that the CPU can actually address that ROM and read it and write, you know, read it properly. So the next thing we need to do is check the clock. Now the obvious way is within oscilloscope, but if you've got a logic probe, you know, 10 pounds, these will cost you roughly, or this is an RS one. Um, I've got a really nice one actually that was sent to me by Colin McKay. Uh, HP is at 547. Uh, I need to start looking at that. But anyway, um, yeah, I digress. You can see there, just with the Logic Pro, can you see it's pulsing? We've got, we've got high and low indicated there, which indicates we have a clock. So, you know, you'd want to maybe uh, check that with a scope or something if you wanted to be 100% sure that your clock is correct, you know, in terms of its level and in terms of the frequency, uh, you know, and you're getting a regularity to it. But in general, yeah, that's enough, you know, just to see the clock there, that is enough to say, okay, we've got a clock, we've got our data bus and address bus connections, we've got our VCC, so in theory, the CPU should be, you know, able to run code from there. But the problem we had in part one is the output enable was not uh, 
working. It was sort of stuck high. Can you see that? That's pulsing. So this is on a, you know, sat there a cross hatch on a standard working board. That's what you'll see. You'll see a pulsing output enable. If you saw a low there, that's a positive sign that at least the, the ROM is enabled. And you would expect something to happen. You see something on the screen. I would think, you know, in terms of diagnostic, um, if it was working okay. Uh, but in my case, it was stuck high, and that was because one of these O5s here. Uh, you can't quite see it, yeah, one of the O5s. Uh, the way it works actually, and I showed it in the last video there, I didn't really explain very much, but all of the address lines go through, they go into those O5s, and the outputs of the O5s are just an inverter. The outputs of the O5s all get merged together, they're just joined together, which I thought was a bit crazy. And then the, the, they form uh, one of the conditions that goes into the XOR here, one of the inputs into the XOR. The idea being that uh, it's the majority, you know, the majority of the address bits, we just, we just want to know whether they're zero, whether they're low or not. And if they're not low, we've got a problem. See what I mean? So that they're all joined together. So, you know, you've got, I don't know, 16, 17 address bits all joined together. If any one of them was high, you've got, you're going to have an issue. That's the way that works. That's the way that XOR is working. You know, like I said, the outputs, you know, all of the ORs of all of the address lines are all going into one single input pin on, those, uh, on that chip, on that XOR gate there. So if any one of them is high, that's when we have an issue, that's when it knows that the address uh, range is not correct. Yeah, so if you've got a problem with uh, a, a one of these boards and it's not corrosion and you're not getting the output enable, you would need to look at those LSO5s and there's a bunch of them, there's like four or five of them, you know, there's going to be because there's an awful lot of address lines and, you know, just check that your address lines are going to each one of them and the outputs are all coming out and the outputs are all joined together and they're all going to your... Uh, the re relevant pins or pin or pins on the uh, XOR gate down here, the LS86. So something else I'll point out that's different uh, to some of the single slot boards. The connectors down here, and I can't be quite sure, I'd need to look at the manual. I might put some text up here just to correct things as I'm going along. But uh, you've got the credit displays, I think, I think they're driven through here. But also the uh, illumination for the uh, different games. You know, so what I mean by that is the top of an MBS cabinet for a six slot, you'd have six little clear windows and you stick the little mini marquee, it's like a little plastic flyer that shows the title of the game and the artwork, it's really nice and you slide it into that glass frame there and there's six of them, one for each game um, and it will control like the illumination behind it to illuminate that slot so when you press the select button, as we seen earlier, you know, to toggle between the six games each of those windows, you know, gets individually illuminated to show which game you've actually got selected so uh, yeah, I'm not sure what which connectors what here and I, like I say, I'm guessing the credit displays come from here I'm not, I, again, I'm not 100% sure on that it's, uh, without having the things to plug in, I can't be 100% sure what I do know is uh, the 2003 chip down here, that one, and I think there's some up here, a 2083, is that a 2803 again? Uh, I think they're transistor arrays, actually. If you look at the data sheets for those, you'll see it's just like a, a series of Darlington transistors, I think, or something in those, which are probably used to drive you know, your LED segments and things like that, and the, the you know, the, that illumination at the back of the marquee there. So it's still a bit dirty this board, but I just want to show you, in terms of these wires, th these were the three wires, you know, there was like three little thin wires on the top side in part one that were really fudgy, and we replaced them, we moved them underneath. One of them I soldered to the other side of the wire, I pushed the kynar through the hole and soldered it on the other side, just to show you the technique more than anything. But what I did with the other two is the prefer preferable thing. What I would try and do is try where you can, steer clear of trying to solder onto these wires that, where they're corroded, because they're just not going to last, you know, they're going to be unreliable, they're so fine on this, this board. On a, a larger, where they've got larger traces on other boards and things from other manufacturers, you might be alright you know, for old arcade boards. Of, of this era, the tracers, you know, because it's a 16-bit system, um, the tracers, um, or you could argue 24-bit in terms of the address, but because it's a 16-bit system, the tracers are super thin, the wires are super thin, it's tightly packed in, um, any, you know, slightly iffy wires, they're not always going to be that reliable to solder onto. So you can see what I did here is, you know, it's a case of putting a meter on uh, the point there, put it on continuity, and... Uh, measuring around or trying to follow follow the wire you know so flip the board over find out where the wire goes on the other side uh, see follow it try and follow the trace with your eye you know and work out where it goes to so you can see you know a couple of these here uh, in fact all three of them if, I just, if you just look up here so all three of these here actually 
make connections up here. You can only determine that from the top side. If you follow these wires on the top side, they sort of go up here somewhere. You go to a wire over there, uh, these three wires here actually, and then these three wires come out to the pins here. So, you know, let's say there's a link there on the top side. Um, so the easiest thing is, is instead of trying to solder from that wire to that wire or that wire to that wire, depending on where the brake is, it's far easier, as I've done with these two here, to solder from where the wire would have gone here, which is that chip. It's nice easy to solder onto that and that's going to be reliable all the way, sorry, Ken was juddering a bit, down to uh, here. And the same with the other one, all the way down to, I think it went there. So I could have done that. And I should really do that with this one. Instead of soldering through the wire onto that really thin trace on the other side. I mean, in that case, it's probably okay because it's not just soldered to the wire, it's going through the wire on the other side to the other side that was okay, if that makes sense. So we've got a fairly reliable connection. But if I was to just solder straight to the wire there, yeah, that's a bit risky in future because these wires here are significantly affected by the alkaline damage there so you never know with a bit of usage and a bit of current going through there heat, you know hot and cold cycles in a year maybe that wire could break but we're not bothered about that because it's going across through the wire onto the trace and the trace is definitely good uh, but anyway you get the point there that uh, try and avoid with this size wire try and avoid soldering to the wires if you can so I think before I start to reassemble it and close things up, I'll just point out something else. I am a favourite of the old chipset, the Pro chipset. Now, whilst these can fail, you can get failures on these chips, from my experience and from reading and research and looking at all the repair logs that are out there, they're a lot more reliable. I find, you know, I found from my studies and my experience that these boards are a lot more reliable than the, some of the newer boards with the newer chipset. You know, so where, you, where they split some of the functionality out, you ended up with the LSPCA2 and a B1, is it? And you got your D0, your I0, your E0, your D0, your G0, all these different zero, ch you know, uh, chips of different letters, you know. Um, they split out, you know, exploded the functionality out there, you know, the C1. Um, I've seen, you know, lots of odd failures in different places of those, but with these, it's a lot less common, certainly from my experience anyway. Uh, and the other thing I've noticed with that is I'm always, you, you see me always touching things like this. I'm a very touchy-feely <laughs> person when it comes to chips. Either when I'm trying to diagnose a fault or just, I'd just do this anyway as a matter of course if this was a working board now I'd be doing this you know when it's been on for 20 minutes and I found these chips do not get warm at all the LSPC gets just very lukewarm these are stone cold I used it yesterday for 20 minutes they were stone cold I couldn't believe it um, and there's, that's a big difference if you compare to say an MV1FZ they get, everything gets pretty warm actually now you could argue it's probably because of the casing and stuff the plastic housing that fits over and stuff that contains the heat but in general these don't get anywhere near as hot as the chips on the newer revisions of the boards actually so for me I'm quite a fan actually of the old chipset uh, despite the fact that these can be quite hard to find as spares uh, I've only seen these I've seen these on a four slot they're on my AES, I've got one of the early first gen AESs, although it's got a slightly different revision, you know, it's probably a, slate, a later revision first gen, because mine's got the little uh, video board there to tidy up the video, the RGB, I don't know if it's the composite or what. I think it was a PLL actually for one of the, uh, the colour burst or something. They added like a little sub board there. But anyway, if you watch that first gen AES repair video I did where I fixed the BIOS, you'll see what I mean. It's got the same chipset. But uh, most of the other single slot boards, I think, have got the, you know, the newer chipsets and stuff. Um, and then you get onto the MV1As, like I showed in the previous video, that's got the, the same sort of chipset as the CDZ or the, uh, yeah, the newer CD. Um, and then obviously the very last revisions, you've got like single chip solution more or less, where you've got one or two really large ASICs that have got everything in. That's like on a like on an MV1C, I think. Uh, I think that's got like a single chip almost with very little else, some RAM and a Yamaha, and that's about it, I think. Now there may be a two slot that uses the Pro chipset. I am not 100% sure. I'll need to go and check that on the wiki, actually. But a lot of the two slots I've seen on other videos and uh, forum articles and things like that seem to use the newer chipset, you know, like the same sort of chips you get on a 1FZ, for example. But you've got a lot of Neo Buff chips and things on there, and those, what are the other ones? There's, there's one that contains a load of 257s, I think, or something similar to that. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not keen on that, because when those fail, they're an absolute pain to deal with. Uh, so I would suggest that, in terms of reliability, if you want a really good, rock solid, reliable multi slot board, I would go for a four slot 
that's been restored to this sort of level or you know that's working that you can maintain and clean up and stuff or a six slot um, and incidentally the six slot if you compare this to the four slot video I did the six slot is more or less the same there might be some subtle differences in oh, but I would suggest if you want a totally reliable uh, multi-slot system I would be looking at the old uh, chipset you know go for something like this uh, one with a pro chipset a, a six slot or a four slot like the one I showed in my previous video there um, and if you compare that video to this one you'll see that the board is pretty much the same the layout is almost identical there may be one or two extra chips on this board to account for the extra slot but I suspect maybe not it might be a configuration thing on this board and it's just been exploded out the top board has definitely obviously got more chips because you've got chips for the individual slots and I'll just briefly show you that in a sec actually that Furtech um, I think it's Furtech, again on the developer wiki, the Neo Geo developer wiki, has put like, some little block diagrams and things and actually the pinouts of the individual chips on the top board, which makes diagnosing faults on that top board super easy. Um, now I didn't need to use that, if something that I think he pointed out just as I've got mine working, but it, it's not really relevant, mine was just corrosion issues, but if you've got a fault with the top board, you could use that di the things I'm going to show you in a sec to w easily work out where the area of the fault is. And talking about reliability and stuff again, the, and you know the top board here. If you look at this, it's exactly the same that the old MV4F uh, I've got as well. That I showed in my previous video. Uh, I'll stick a link to it up there or something. Um, you'll see that the you know there's a massive amount. I mean a huge amount of TTL logic on here. There are no custom chips whatsoever, uh, and that is highly desirable. It might seem the opposite. You might think, oh my god, there's a crazy amount of chips that I really don't want something that complicated. But actually, the fact that this is all discrete logic, you know, you can buy these off the shelf now. Um, some of them might start getting low in stock over the next five, ten years, I don't know, but I don't think so. The trend seems to be that these are still manufactured, there's still places in China manufacturing tons and tons and tons of these. So, at the moment, the stock levels are very high. You could easily stock up on spares for this now, you know, in advance, buy yourself packs of ten of each type of chip, and you're going to be fine forever. Um, but the bottom line is, because it's all discrete ICs here, you know, discrete TTL logic, you can replace them super easy. It's just the time and effort. It's working out where the fault is, taking some time to desolder them, put a socket on, replace. But the newer versions of the 4 slot, now I don't know whether there's a newer version of the 6 slot, but certainly there is with the 4 slot. With the 4 slot they did a newer revision of it, which uses things like the Neo Buff chip and some of those, you know, the newer chipset, you know, a C1, a, a D0, etc. I think, from memory. Um, so those boards, yeah, you know, they're still good, but it's easier, in my opinion, to actually to maintain one of these, and reliability-wise, I think these are probably going to be more reliable, but that's just an opinion based on my limited exposure I've had to repairing these and the, the, you know, the research I've done over the years, being a forum hog, if you like. So yeah, here's that image from the Neo Geo wiki there. So it's uh, yeah, blurry and uh, small as anything. It's just a quick, easy way for me to show you. But you can see, you know, this is the layout of the board here, and. Uh, yeah, if you look at that, those two chips there that are offset, they're the chips, let me just show you, they're the chips up there. So as we look at the board like that, it's like kind of like that, if you see what I mean. So um, you can see, you know, it explains what the different blocks of chips are. Uh, let me just try and zoom in there. So that first block there, Sprite Data, CBUS, lower part, you know, so that's a C Data bus, which corresponds with these here. So straight away, if you know you've got a problem with the character graphics, you know you've got lines and stripes and things with the graphics there, it doesn't quite look right on a particular slot, you're into the realms of that area there. And then the other thing that's super nice is you can see a slot part, uh, slot 6, C details, and you've got slot 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, so the chips that extend out the sides of these are related to the individual slots, which makes sense, because what you don't want is traces going right across the board from one place to another, where you can avoid it. So, you know, they've, they've you know, married up the chips at the sides of the slots there, um, which is really sweet. And you can see there's some more blocks there at the bottom, down the bottom, you know, the chips there split into two bits. You've got the Sprite Data C data bus higher part, uh, and then you've got your Fix data bus there as well. So that's these two chunks of chips here. 
And again, I'm not going to show you everything here. I'll put a link down below to the wiki where you can see this. But you can see part of it here. You know, for the individual chips, he's actually gone as far as putting the inputs, the outputs, how everything works for every single one of the different types of chips. But then within the different areas for each slot, he's gone, uh, you know, again, a stage further and shown you the exact pinouts. You know, so if you were to find that 244 and that block for that particular slot, you can see it relates to the 68K and it's A16 to A19. The one next to it, A8 to A15. You know, you've got your read and write lines, your data bus, more address lines, more data lines, some of the program interface, P1 to P15, P17, P23, P16, 22. You know, so everything's there. It's super easy. You know, your Z80 stuff's over here, your PCM stuff. So you could quite easily use that, the, the first image I showed, to work out which, you know, where the chips are. And then you could use the little uh, tables he's got there, you know, those little diagrams to work out which uh, chip you're looking at. You know, is it the Z80, is it the PCM, you know, which, which one is it? Uh, and you can narrow down super easy. So that is absolutely invaluable. Hats off to Furtec or whoever else help to work on that that is just a massive help to a community big time because this is one of the this is the area you would spend a lot of time trying to work through actually uh, you know because you'd be you one of your first things if you're trying to reverse engineer this one of the first things you're gonna have to do is start measuring connectivity you know look at your pinouts for your slot you know if you think there's a problem with your program interface you need to work out which where your program bus is on here and then start doing connectivity tests all around trying to follow the traces uh, and it could be super time consuming if you've got two or three different problems on different slots you'd be out for hours and hours and hours whereas so, those diagrams just shown you that are on the wiki there the time that has been taken by Furtec and other people to do those connectivity things there and the pinouts and work out which chip is doing what, it's the equivalent of, in fact it's better than in some ways, a schematic for this top board. And there are no schematics available for these top boards. Uh, and I might be talking rubbish because Furtec might actually be working on one or might, might have one that he's not published or something. But in general there are no publicly available schematics for these multi-slot boards. The bottom board, it's kind of standard stuff. Obviously with a pro chip set that can cause you some issues because the, the service manuals that are out there, the schematics, are for the 1F I think and the 1FZ, you know, the AES schematics. So they deal with the, the newer chip set, the, uh, uh, A, uh, the D0, the C1, uh, the LSPCA2 etc. They deal with that chip set. Um, so if you're trying to use those schematics some of the stuff can make sense you can use the schematics from the newer board but you're going to start running into problems when you start trying to work out you know for example clocks coming from your d0 where does that come from well you what you can do is on the neo geo developer wiki that again Furtec and uh, various people have helped do the pinouts for these three ls the, the three chips here the pro chips and the original lspc so with these two pro chips you can work out where your clock signals come from etc or your z80 uh, you know uh, interface your arbitration all that sort of stuff you can uh, work it out because the pin names kind of give it away as you look down the pin names for example if you were looking to do uh, looking for something to do with the z80 you would find uh, a pin number you know a few pins there related you know have some sort of z80 relationship so you could then maybe look back at the the 1f schematics with the C1 and stuff and try and see what where the commonality is how how it's how the functionality is moved moved into here from maybe from a C1 etc um, so you kind of just got to you know mix and match the, the diagrams from the newer chipset with the pinouts for the old chipset to try and make sense of it but uh, I'm sure at some point we might get a, you know maybe a full set of schematics for one of these but we, we've got a really head start, a good head start with the pinouts and the diagrams and things that are on the Neo Geo developer wiki. And at the point when I was talking about disabling the watchdog with J2 there, now don't bear in mind, J, don't just use J2 on any board, only on the maybe the four slot and the six slot with the pro chip set here. The, the jumpers may change between boards. You may find J2 on a, I don't know, 1FZ is something else. There is, a, there is a jumper like this on pretty much all the boards, I think all the boards, to disable the watchdog if you wanted to stop it from resetting so you can take some measurements there. Um, but yeah, that's J2 right next to the LSPC on this board. Final thing I'll point out before I reassemble this, it is using all its original chips. Not one of those has had to be replaced. I cleaned up the pins with fiberglass pen, you know, a number of times after I got rid of the last little bits of corrosion and they all look super 
fantastic. I think when I was trying to point out how clean one of these chips up here was, uh, it was the 259, wasn't it? In the previous video, I had a new one in there. That's why it looks super, super, super shiny. That was a mistake in part one. But I did put the, uh, the, the original one back on there, clean that up. But yeah, hopefully you can see that. Can you see? They look, uh, they look really good, actually. I mean, look how clean the pins are. They're fantastic. You'd never know there'd been any corrosion on that. So when I did my four slot, one of the things I did with that, I wanted to get the headphone, I wanted to use the headphone output. Um, and initially, I was like convinced one of these was going to be the headphone output. Now, it turns out that no output comes from these, or if it does, it's such a low level, it's like unamplified or something. So it's, it's nothing to do with these sliders here, from what I remember. And I think someone else looked at this on the Neo Geo forum, actually, MKL. And he was uh, convinced that one of th these were inputs, or one of them was an input, not an output. I'm not sure how you would use that. Why would you have an input? I don't know, unless they had some capability to have an audio feed that gets merged through and goes through the op amps. Maybe you could have uh, sound from you know, a, a, a speaker system or something related to the arcade so that you could, uh, I don't know, play music or notifications about offers at the uh, at bar or what. I don't really know. I don't know what you would use it for. Having an audio input seems a bit crazy. But that's not absolutely confirmed. It hasn't, I haven't actually read anywhere that that's definitely exactly what's going on. So what I did is I just repurposed one of these. I cut the traces going to you know the left and right connections on them underneath on the fourth slot and I soldered the wires and I think for memory serves it was the edge connections I think the center points were ground might not be on this one but I think on the fourth slot two center points were ground and the outer pins were like left and right and uh, I just wired from the underside to the underside of here where I'd cut the things off so that I could use one of these as a headphone output and then the headphone slider worked fine um, I did recap my fourth slot so I might recap this anyway but I'm not going to do that on this one. I don't want to cut the traces because this the board is in, you know, apart from the corrosion, it's in really good condition. It's super clean. It works perfectly. So I think what I would do is I'm going to get a, a connector to fit on here. It's not JST, is it? It's something like that. But I'll get a four pin connector, fly off to a socket and heat, encapsulate it all in heat shrink so that I've got a 3.5 mil fly off. Uh, lead. That's what I'll do on this one. And you could do a similar thing. Uh, and at some point, if I decide to consoleize the metal can and stuff, you know, get it pa painted as I mentioned earlier and stuff, um, I could always just mount that 3.5 millimeter socket somewhere on the metal engine there, you know, and just run a wire off to it. Yeah, the frustrating thing is these screws, the best I could do is try and clean them up with wire brush and cotton buds and fiberglass pen and get a bit of WD 40 on there. So you can see most of the corrosions come off the, the head around them they're still a bit corroded but the corrosion has gone on the thread underneath and I've done the same thing on the thread underneath but they are well and truly jammed in there all that's going to happen I'm going to tear the screw uh, heads up if I'm not careful or I'll just break the nut off and stuff and then I'll need a new uh, you know screw uh, with a new nut and everything so I don't see any point in uh, going out my way to destroy those to take them off when at this point in time it's not needed if that regular you know needed swapping or failed or whatever you could just do that you know you might have to just break the darn things off and replace it but uh, yeah it's not the end of the world so just when I thought we'd solve this, uh, it's given me a parting blow kind of thing, just as uh, <laughs> just about to put it in storage. I put a, uh, the mask run back on there and I get stuck at the green screen. I'll just show you. Now bear in mind, it's passing all the tests, the diagnostics, uh, when it tests the calendar and stuff and all that sort of stuff. No problems at all. But we don't get a cross hatch and uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. I've tried a few different uh, mask runs here. Um, from the different boards I've been looking at for uh, Mike Perman actually uh, it's doing the same thing with all of them so it's not the mask ROM but if I put a Unibios in it works fine if I put the Unibios hardware test you know disable the hardware enable the hardware testing there's no problems no errors put the SMK Dan diagnostics in there's no errors but with an actual mask ROM we just get stuck here we don't get a cross hatch so um, the first thing I'm thinking is the calendar that is the one chip that hasn't been removed actually, uh, just above the HC32. So I'm just going to remove that now anyway actually. Um, I'm going to get the desoldering station onto it, the new one, uh, which you've not seen yet. Uh, and remove and socket that because there is maybe a tiny bit of corrosion around it. Maybe that's what the problem is. So whilst the diagnostics thinks it's okay, maybe it's not got all its connectivity. I don't know. So that's the clock chip there. Uh, I'll just desolder the connections. 
we'll inspect uh, underneath it and get the uh, socket on there. Yeah, I suspect the ground and the VCC uh, are going to need some more uh, temperature actually. Super hard to do at this distance. I prefer the well up because I can't even get onto the top of it. You know, you've got you've got such a distance away from the thing. Well, the interesting thing is, uh, I socketed it up. Now, what I didn't do is I didn't see all test pass right. I didn't test that calendar before I removed the chip. But you can see there, waiting for calendar pulse. There's a problem. Now if I probe the uh, crystal I don't see any oscillation actually. Um, I've ordered uh, a couple of new watch crystals, uh, it's the same frequency, and we'll try and swap out the crystal but that's a really strange failure at this point in the repair here, you know, I was literally reassembling it. Um, crystals can fail from impacts, you know, you, you knock them, a sharp uh, impact can break the crystal internally. It's uh, very strange. I'm sure the connectivity around the uh, UPD4990 there was okay, but I am sure as well, when we got this working early on, I'm sure one of the first things we saw was this pulsing away. I'm sure it was. So I socketed that up and I cleaned up the legs super clean. Uh, I couldn't see any damage there. I put a new crystal, at that point it started working last night. Came to test it again today and uh, it stopped working again. And I found if you leave this to warm up for about five or six minutes, switch it off and on, the clock then works, you know, uh, you get pulsing down the, the diagnostics. No problems at all. And if you've got an official BIOS, it will then get past the green screen. So there's, there's something going on here and I can't quite work out what. I don't have a spare 4990. I've got one on a, a 1F I'm looking at. I could borrow that temporarily just to test the theory. Um, but the resistor pack is the only thing here that's not come off and there was a fair bit of corrosion around the HC32. I did swap out the 32 just a minute ago just to rule that out but it's exactly the same, it won't work you know, unless it's warmed up. Um, there's a possibility as the, as the board warms up one of the wires or something just starts to make connectivity but uh, I see I've got you know pulsing, you know, I've got activity all the way around that, apart from the second from top, you know, the second from top uh, pin here, which connects to one of the clock pins, you know, the crystal pins here, that seems like high impedance. But you get the same thing when it's running. When it's running, if you probe them, you'll actually, in fact, with the, the logic probe there, it affects the clock. It stops pulsing while you m measure it with the probe there on either of the pins, uh, you know, connected to the uh, chip there. For the, between the crystal and the chip. Uh, the only other pin that's not connected is the data in pin here. That seems to be floated at the moment. Uh, now that seems to go to this resistor pack. So I'm going to remove that resistor pack next just to make sure that that resistor pack is okay. I'll measure it and have a look at the connections underneath because it could just be that there's a really uh, flaky connection on that one pin there. But I would expect that data in pin perhaps wouldn't it be needed. I would expect to maybe see something if this was you know if, the, if this was working correctly. I don't think the data in pin would be causing the problem. Uh, maybe it would. I don't know. Uh, anyway we'll remove that resistor pack. So the resistor array came off as you can see. There's no damage there. Uh, that's just a bit of uh, stuff to cover it you know the uh, nail polish there that you used earlier. There's two wires connected to the HC32, they seem okay. Um, the pin, this pin here, the second one from the end here, this is the one that was uh, seems to be floating. Just connects straight to that pad there and it measures as a short. So I'm not sure, I've measured the resistor array, it's 10k. Um, so you know you've got a common pin. So if you put one end of your multimeter on, uh, you know, put it on resistance mode, put one uh, probe on the common pin there, the one that's got its little dots on the package itself. You can see that little dot there, that indicates pin one. Um, and you just measure from that first pin to each of the other pins and you'll have 10k, 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 all the way along. So yeah, that's how it measures. So I'm just going to reinstall it. Maybe we just had a really bad connection because they were quite corroded, the solder contacts. Uh, and I'll see what happens, I don't know. So I'm going to swap out the 4990 because you can see it's just hanging there on the green screen. Let's try that again. And um, we'll put the replacement 4990 in. Switch it on. 
And it's doing the same thing. Oh, joy. So I think I finally uh, worked out what's wrong with the clock. I've had to take off two of the sockets here. Um, what, and to, to just do some tracing, now I did take photos of these as I removed them, but my camera on my iPhone, well, the iPhone, the battery went flat and uh, I couldn't boot the phone at all. It said it was faulty, I had to restore the firmware and all sorts. So I ended up losing everything off my phone, including the photos. So I had no choice but to remove the two sockets from there to inspect, because it's super hard to follow where traces are going with the sockets on there. Uh, I mean, you can see a little bit, you know, through the gaps and stuff, but it was just far easier. It took a minute to remove each one, uh, and with the new desolder station, actually, they came off super easy. I was uh, very impressed, actually, how easily they came off. Um, so I found uh, the 174 up here, the three of the connections, I think, um, go to this, and one connection was missing on pin two of the 174, um, and it comes up, it's one of the wires here, it comes out here, you can see I covered over with the... Uh, nail polish and the wires okay connected to the wires okay but the trace that's next to it there was no connection so from the end of the wire it was disconnected from the trace so uh, yeah I'll put some more uh, uh, nail polish over there because I've pierced the two holes to try and do some connectivity testing you know to work out what's wrong but I think fingers crossed that's all it was the other connections I've managed to trace to other places on the board uh, I'm not sure where two of them go the, the two of the connections up here um, these two, I think, come down through two little connections here all the way down. I don't think there's any problems there, so I'm just taking gamble really by sticking the sockets back on, but I have just took another couple of photos just in case, and we'll patch up that link to uh, pin two here, um, and hopefully that should solve the uh, clock problem. Woohoo, calendar issue fixed. That was it, it worked first time, even though the board is, well, largely cold, apart from the, the little bit where I've just been soldering those two chips. So yeah, uh, it was just a missed trace. So I'll quickly show you this. This is the most useless diagram ever, really. Um, you've got the notch on the chip there. Uh, that's pin one. So the, I'll show you the connectivity I do know. So pin one, two, and three were connected to VCC on the uh, 4990 there. The fourth pin uh, normally would go to the F0. In my case, it goes to the 174 pin seven. Uh, there are a few 174s, but you saw which one I was pointing to there. Um, earlier. The HC32 is the next pin on pin 3. Uh, then again it would normally go to the pin on the F0 on the newer boards but on my case it goes to the 174 pin 2. That was the wire I was missing um, and I, I marked that as high impedance there because uh, there was a, that, that's what that indicated when I was trying to measure things. So at one point yeah I was getting like a high impedance signal so that was a bit of a clue but it fluctuated between high and high impedance which is a bit strange. The ground is obviously you know on TTL is uh, that last pin there. Um, again a connection to the 174 down here uh, on pin 5. These are the two that I couldn't trace. I didn't. I could have spent time. They the, were the ones that I pointed out that went right down to the bottom of the board near the uh, memory card interface. There's a couple of wires down there and this so I don't know where they went from there but they're well out of the realm of the battery area so I wasn't too worried about those two pins uh, and then uh, the You've got a, a connection here, uh, joins to a connection down here, so you need to make sure that you've got that when you're measuring connectivity. Uh, two clock pins here, uh, and then your VCC. So it's quite straightforward. The only thing I wasn't too sure about is those two pins that are, you know, yeah, Yoshi's yeah, taking interest. Those two pins that I mentioned, uh, I'm not sure where they go, but hopefully that might be useful if you've got a problem with your uh, calendar, you know, clock calendar error on one of these six slots. So just testing with a few, uh, you know, from cold, power ons and it seems to be working every time. Uh, there's a couple of points I'll uh, mention here and that is your logic probe is your friend actually when you're trying to find broken traces but there's a caveat. So what I mean by that is well your logic probe you know it's going to show you high, uh, low or if you you know a decent one high impedance you know in my case it doesn't show you know neither of the LEDs light which shows you've got no connection to that pin. Uh, and that is super useful. You know, you're going around any of these TTL chips here, OR gates, AND gates, XORs, NOT gates, etc. You would expect to have inputs and outputs on every pin, actually. Now, it may well be that on some gates, uh, some gates are not used, you know, so you've got a bunch of NOT gates used on a, uh, you know, 7404, for example. Uh, one of the gates might have an input tied to ground, you know, directly because they're not using that gate. But you would still have an input and you'd still measure an output. So as you're going around these TTL chips, you find a high impedance um, point there. It's something that needs 
further investigation. Now, the, pro the caveat I mentioned and the problem I had with this and the reason it didn't help me find this particular issue is there are pull-ups, some pull-up resistors, you know that resistor pack that I removed earlier? That sits on these uh, three or four lines actually that come out to, I think they go to the F0 on a, a, the new Neo Geo boards, but on this the logic is discrete, you know, you've got TTL logics doing the, the same functionality there that the F0 is probably doing on the newer boards. So because you've got that pull-up resistor on there, you will measure a high regardless. So even though you might be lacking a connection on those four pins, you would still uh, measure a high. So you can't go off, you know, that as 100%, but when you trying to rule out connectivity issues it's certainly a good place to start looking for high impedance connections on uh, any of the TTL logic there uh, but as you know as I say, you, you can't just go off that you may well uh, you know you need to look where you've got pull-ups so you've got a pull-up there just question those connections you know wherever you've got a pull-up you know look at those and go okay well we're seeing the pull-up but are we actually connected to something somewhere uh, and that was the case with this we just had one broken connection to the uh, 174 there on pin 2 so before I reassemble this here, I'll just point something out. This switch, I'm going to leave it on here because it is a piece of history. But it's not, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have come from factory with this on, is the point I'm trying to make. Um, the other thing is, what this actually does is it just blanks the uh, the RAM, you know, the backup RAM. Uh, and the way it works is, I can't remember exactly how it was wired now, but I think the positive connection was running through here, through this switch. Uh, and then back through to the battery. So one end of the battery is coming into the switch, the other end was going to ground. So in theory, when you press this, you were grounding the uh, VCC connection there, which would drain the battery, but ultimately give you, you know, a, a low potential across the two points. So, you know, instead of having, I don't know, 3.6 volts across the, uh, the backup RAM, you might drop it to a volt or something, or less, you know, as it discharges the battery. So it was a bit crazy because you're shorting out the battery. And at the same time, the other reason it's a bit crazy is if you think about it, if this was powered up now and you've got your VCC there, Bear in mind, you know, it charges the battery, but you'll have, I don't know, 4 volts or something like that going to the, uh, the RAM there. And if you were to short this out, you're shorting out the charge circuit. So, I mean, you, you know, you could, in theory, actually kill the, the RAM with latch up or something like that. So, yeah, it's quite dangerous. The original thing I thought is I wondered if it was put here like this so that when you got the metal edge on, it would be held in place all the time. You know, and then you removed it, it went off. Um, that might be the case. I could be. I need to check that. I'm just wondering if I've got the logic. I've not checked which way this is wired. It could be that when it's on, it's using the battery. And when the lid's off, it's grounded. But that would then be a problem if you left it connected and you were powering it up without the lid on. See what I mean? Because you're going to be grounding that out. And then again, you could kill these with latch up or something. So yeah. In any case, I'm not going to reconnect it. But I will just leave it there, just because, let's say, it's interesting. If anything. So yeah, just testing with one slot uh, at the moment, but yeah, this vinyl, I could take it off. Uh, I mean, it's not even really vinyl, it's like a plastic that someone's stuck down on there. It, I'll leave it on there for the moment because it's just protecting it. But at some point, what I might do is send this off to a friend of mine who does professional spray jobs on uh, you know custom consoles and get him to uh, paint it maybe. It might need a bit of filler because the lid is a bit bent on one side as I showed earlier, it's, it's kind of not straight. I suspect if I removed this you'd see a little dip in one corner where it's been bent. But anyway, hopefully you found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.